Thank you so much for having me here. This is my very first visit to LGS community and the foundation. And, um, but I, I've always felt like I was part of LGS community because we do take care of many children with uh, lenas gestor syndrome. Cognition in LGS was a, a tough uh, one to cover in a way. Um, you are very aware of it, and I did not want to be the uh, bad news bearer. Uh, however, you live it every day, um, and I think it would be good for you to hear it, but, well, what's behind it. So it's not just LGS, it's the really IQ of children with epilepsy. If you look at the normal curve with um, average being 100, and these little dots that's plotted uh, for children with epilepsy, there are some um, brilliant ones, uh, graded in 130, but th the curve is shifted to the left. But for me, the hardest thing as a physician taking care of children over time uh, was that we watched them deteriorate over time, and there was much that we were doing to address that issue. The longer you have uncontrolled seizures, your full-scale IQ drops from average of 105 down to 60. And this was happening in front of my eyes, and I had nothing that we could offer. And I, I, one of the, my um, driving force of passion was, why can't we do something about it? Why are we so focused on seizure control when, in fact, what matters most is this deterioration that happens over time. And we talk about evolution of LGS. Why are we just watching it? And why can't we stop it from happening and getting worse? And I think the focus of research and, and, and our team effort should be that. And this is a, a, a amazing pic pictorial, pictorial depiction of uh, follow-up that Dr. Ann Burke has spearheaded in 2015, published um, in Epilepsia, where she followed this was famous Connecticut study. It started following 516 children from the onset of epilepsy for over 20 years. And you would agree that our LGS community belongs to that red bar, where there was never a break, the long-term refractory. Um, and we are talking about those children where you see deterioration over time. And of course, I learned so much from every child and from every family. But one person, one child that I will never forget is JJ. She, I met her when she was seven years old. She had an obligatory left-handedness because she suffered from stroke in utero. However, she. Okay, she was born with dense right hemiparesis, but had no seizures in newborn period and doing very well. Until at age three, she contracted uh, herpes encephalitis. This was a really second um, hit for her. Uh, despite very quick um, treatment with acyclovir, she started to have seizures, and the seizures were explosive. Um, and it never ended. Um, by age four, um, the proper diagnosis of Lenas Gestor syndrome was made. She was experiencing epileptic spasms, tonic seizures, tonic absence, myoclonic absences. And every, every medication we knew existed uh, was tried. Phenobarbital, clobaz, uh, carbamazepine, levetiracetam, topiramid, valproacid, lamotrigine, valproic lamotrigine combination. I even tried ACTH, zonisamide, clobazam, and valvamate. And she was having 35 to 30, 65 small seizures and uh, 50 to 70 big seizures every day. And every time they came to see me, a dad would basically be very tearful and do something, do something about these seizures, these past seizures, they're not going away. And this was a uh, kind of corollary of the, that Connecticut study where uh, Ann Berg have put just together with those children with lenas gestor syndrome. And JJ will fall into that 300 plus seizure days per year. 
and of course she suffered from severe intellectual disability. Um, and it's not surprising that, that such frequent seizures will lead to severe intellectual disability. And, but more than half of them had not severe but moderate intellectual disability. And this was a study um, done a long time ago in Finland. Um, and this was a combination of infantile spasm with Lennox Gastaut syndrome. And um, the, there were about one third of infantile spasm evolved into Lennox Gastaut in this cohort. It was followed from 1976 to 1993, over a 20 year period. And um, some of them became seizure free. And those who did very well have a typical development was those infantile spasm that did not evolve into Lennox Gastaut. Those, those infants who were treated promptly and did not have any ideology known, they did the best. Um, some of them had borderline uh, intellectual disability, mild to severe. But profound inf intellectual disability was really those children, unfortunate enough, to be, have either genetic uh, condition or uh, brain injury early in life, they had combination. These are the children who had infantile spasm, which then evolved to Lennox Gastaut. And, and those, uh, uh, about 40% of Lennox Gastaut children, they are the ones who are most affected. Um, and that I think we are aware of that. And why is that? Uh, we will have some theories about this. Um, this is a study of 38 adults with LGS, 16 uh, men who age, uh, mean age of 43 years. And um, it's no longer uh, uh, happening daily. So they, in general, had weekly or monthly seizures by the time they're older. And sometimes they had only sporadic uh, seizures. And there you see um, severe in intellectual disability and, and moderate intellectual disability. Um, and this is something that we have, have lived with for, uh, and, and watched happening over time. So you say, in order for us to do something about it, we actually have to understand better why. And sometimes you have answers, sometimes you don't. And I have, my thought was, um, our young brain has, is resilient, and we are, the people are resilient. And I feel like when they don't have a break, the ability to recover from each insult could not, was surfaced. So it's not that we, we are unable to compensate, but our ability to compensate has been compromised because of this. So we talk about slow spike and wave discharges. You see seizures, but this kind of background is there constantly when they are younger. So how are we supposed to recover from this constant bombardment of abnormal EEG? These are the spike discharges. The cells are firing together all the time. And they are, the children are unable to connect with the world. And when they fall asleep, there's this burst of polyspikes, very nasty looking polyspikes. And we talked about beta bars. These are very nasty looking beta bars. And it, it's, even if they are not having seizures, you see this happening all the time. They just don't get a break. And I think that's why we see this deterioration in intellectual uh, ability, because they do not get the break. So we have this concept that put together and formalized by Dr. Berg and Cross in 19, 2010, where we talk about um, epileptic activity itself that may contribute to severe cognitive and behavioral impairment above and beyond what might be expected from the underlying pathology alone, such as stroke, such as hemimegalencephaly, such as cortical malformation. And this becomes even more important when it happens in early life because it interferes with the development of function during critical period. And I think of critical period, and the best example was with the visual cortex, where I think you're aware um, 
in early life, they, if you close one eye, they forever are unable to see through that contralateral side, the brain, the brain formation. And to me, though, the best example was the songbirds. And especially in Atlanta, when I walk, especially in the springtime, we are very green, there are a lot of trees, and what you hear is the songs singing, the birds singing, and the, usually it's the father birds who sings, doo-doo, uh, and then you hear the very similar echoing, doo-doo, on the other side. So if you don't learn to sing during this very critical period of time, and there's actually a small collection of cells in the brain, in the bird brain, where it's dedicated to song learning. And if you do not develop the song during that period of time, the birds don't learn to sing. And guess what happens if you don't learn to sing? You don't find a mate. It's a big deal, right, in the song, in the, the birds' world. You need to learn to sing to attract the mate. And I think this is the um, kind of critical period where you need to do something during that time and when epileptic activity, the, the abnormal EEG activity is interfering with that development of brain circuitry. So this is a, a slide borrowed from Ann Berg, which talks about the epileptic cacophony. And when you have this burst of activity, the song you write at the end is something that cannot be really understood. And I think this gave me such a, a powerful visual effect of, of our connectivity that has gone awry. So do we just sit and cry? What can we do about it? Or do we know anything from research that has been done? And is there something more that we could do? And tomorrow, I have some proposal uh, as a basic scientist, what I were able to do uh, in, the, in the animal model. But today, I'm going to just describe to you what is easily uh, reachable and where we are now compared to where we were many, many years ago. So this is, a, I thought, most best example of um, how medicine, the correct versus incorrect medicine, can have on the cognitive outcome. Actually, you can say that the, the many children um, with Dravet syndrome uh, had a myoclonic seizures, and we don't see myoclonic seizures anymore. Well, it turns out that one of the most common medications that were used in children when they have a focal seizures were carbamazepine and lamotrigin. And those children you'd, would have worsening of seizures. And parents will say, my child is worse. And the doctors will say, it's supposed to be anticonvulsant. What do you mean it's worse, right? So they go up and up and up on the medication. They have worse and worse and worse seizures. Come to the emergency room in status epilepticus. These are the green, blue line is the, those children on wrong medicine, less than 15, 11 months. And the red line is those who are on the wrong medicine that worsened the seizures, that exacerbated seizures for longer than 11 months, when talking about almost a year on the wrong drug. And you see the difference, the worsening of the IQ because they were in the wrong drug, meaning they were having worse seizures, right? But also see that in this, there is not that much of a difference. I mean, the ability of the brain to recover from these insults are in a way, amazing. So you need to be aware, and then I always, when I teach fellows and residents, I, that's just what I say. Any anticonvulsant has a potential to become pro-convulsant, and you have to be aware and speak and complain loudly when you think that your gut says this medicine is making seizures worse, and don't just uh, accept. No, it cannot be, because it can and you know them best. <laughs> another, another little hope we have is this. Um, if um, IQ was very, very low, it didn't make a difference. However, if they had uh, some level of intelligence, if you happen to be lucky one to be surgical candidate, some of these IQ drop was reversible not you know, that back to 100, but they, 
this study have shown that receptive surgery in the Nascaster syndrome uh, could really improve IQ after surgery. And we'll take that, we'll take that. So let me tell you a little about JJ, what happened to her. Um, because dad one day told me, like, you cannot say, don't, don't tell me to try another medicine, we gotta do something. And I told him that because this, her Lennox Kessler syndrome is because of uh, herpes encephalitis, um, that she won't be a very good surgical candidate because it's multifocal, um, even from the mechanism of how it all evolved. But she, he insisted, he begged, he cried, he begged, we, you just do a little more workup. So we did a pre-surgical workup, um, and the mag, the magnetoencephalogram, localized some of the spikes coming from the left occipital lobe behind the encephalomalacia from her stroke. So he, she underwent um, both receptive and disconnection surgery. Um, did very well. Um, of course, she wasn't seizure-free, but she was doing okay. And when we thought things couldn't get any worse, and um, what happened was she got ill, she stopped eating and drinking, and she could not take any of her medications, and she presented to emergency room in status epilepticus, uh, was put on pentobar coma, and I, I just have this memory of her in the ICU with flatline, because um, they put them medical uh, coma, it was more suppressed than burst, and there was like no life in her brain at that time. Um, it was it was just um, eye-opening for us, like, oh my God, when we thought, you know, daily seizure was bad enough, here we are in, in a medication-induced coma. She recovered, we made a decision, turns out that she refused medicine regularly. She just wouldn't take it, and mom and dad had to beg for the medicine to be taken, so we decided together that this was time for G-tube. And G-tube was the best thing that happened for her, um, because then she could get a ketogenic diet. Um, that really made her made a difference. And the last I heard, I, this, uh, she was a patient of mine in um, Louis Children's at Northwestern University since I moved to Emory. I heard that she got into the, um, enrolled in the Epidiolex trial, and that was uh, a big blessing for her, and, and doing uh, quite well at this point. So to just to have a summary thoughts on cognition in, in Lennox Kester syndrome. Yes, cognition is affected uh, in LGS. In fact, intellectual disability is considered to be one of the hallmarks of LGS sometimes used as a definition, part of the definition of LGS, and it is a prototype epileptic encephalopathy. Frequent seizures and interictal epileptic discharges contribute to intellectual disability. I would avoid meds that exacerbate seizures or cognition. If sleeping a lot causes them to have more seizures, you should try to get rid of the sedating medication. Try and try again to find the right medications the right combination of anti-seizure medication. Consider surgery, ketogenic diet, and other non-pharmacological interventions. Don't give up. When I was taking care of Lennox Gaston syndrome patients and I complained to my, my um, wonderful teacher, Dr. Rossman, uh, he was laughing at me and said, don't complain. In the, in the, Back in, you know, 40 years ago, all we got was phenobarbital. And guess what he did with phenobarbital and Lennox Gaston syndrome? He will say, okay, mom, let's increase phenobarbital, cut the tablet in quarter and give her a quarter, well, one more, quarter more. Come back in two weeks. Let's, still not better, let's give half tablet. Still not better, let's then add Second tablet. So he would go up, up, up on the phenobarbital. Um, six weeks later, mom said, but he's sleeping all the time. Oh, well then, let's cut the tablet in quarter and let's bring down one quarter. But he never said, there's nothing I could do. He always said, let's do something together with the family. 
So we are in a much better position than phenobarbital alone. We have so many options. And now the combination is really, no, there is no real limit to the combination. So I think there is a reason for us to be hopeful. Um, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to give a shout out to Dr. Enberg, who helped me a great deal. Of course, I everything I learned about epilepsy, I learned from Enberg. <laughs> but especially this time, she was so generous to let me use some of her uh, slides. Thank you, Anne. <laughs>